what I was interested in have people sample us. And it's just the first year. We had to get through year one, and we've got through it successfully. It was a year of high hopes, high hops, and high kicks. Some cried, and some just got carried away. And the best got to bathe in the bubbly. Most can only wonder what a feeling that must be. What a feeling. The story of the inaugural season of the United States Football League. At long last, Commissioner Chet Simmons gave the signal to spring into action. And the eyes of the sports world were on the football. Well, after the opening day jitters, Tim Mazzetti's inaugural kickoff was returned by George Ragsdale, and the spring fling was underway. Tampa Bay's John Reeves threw for the first down, uh, that is, the first first down, and lest we forget, the league's first spike by Anthony Steeles. And now for something completely different, a double deflected pass interception by Boston's Terry Love, who found out that a 102-yard return wasn't quite long enough. Opening day spirits were sky high, and the LA Express rejoiced at the expense of the USFL's most celebrated player. A 21-year-old Georgian named Herschel Walker was just trying to keep his head on straight under the bright lights of stardom. Herschel was no overnight success story, and college football's best player had his hands full just making it in the pros. the fruits of his efforts began to show. And the New Jersey Generals had the gem they expected. Walker gained more than 100 yards seven times and more than 1,800 in all. Running away with a league rushing title, Herschel Walker easily lived up to expectations. George Allen had similar hopes for his own top draft choice, Tremaine Johnson. And many experts predicted that Allen Chicago Blitz would run away and hide from the rest of the USFL. Johnson became the league's leading receiver, and at the start, the blitz seemed right on course. But in Arizona, even a 17-point fourth-quarter lead wasn't safe when a scrambling rookie from LSU named Alan Risher began to work his magic. The Wranglers of Doug Shively got a last-second field goal from Jim Asmus to cap a stunning comeback victory and give Arizona that indescribable field. The mighty blitz had fallen in the league's first major upset, and the word was out that anything goes in the USFL. From the Meadowlands in New Jersey to the Coliseums in California, every team had its own good luck charm. Denver Gold Fanatics numbered more than 41,000 per game, and the league's overall season average of 25,000 per contest reflected well on the future of a young but healthy idea. But sometimes a great notion goes awry, and spring football often looked like anything but. April showers gave way to more showers in May. And then keeping cool became the name of the game. But through it all, the sunniest dispositions belong to the cheerleaders, whose special appeal gave the USFL that extra added touch of excitement. Tonight, tonight we're gonna make it happen. Tonight we'll put all of us things 
tried to fire up his coach. Steve, I think it's nice for you to be laid back. I think that's very good. And to be quiet and all the things that you are. But you're getting boring. But if you keep winning, it doesn't matter. Steve Spurrier's bandits had a script full of surprises. And when they opened the season with three straight wins, they stole a lot of hearts in Tampa. In a battle between the league's only two undefeated teams, the Bandits won a high-scoring showdown in Philadelphia, while the star sensational Calvin Bryant continued to make Philly fans forget that other runner named Walker. The Stars had assembled a powerful offensive line for Bryant, but the rookie from North Carolina proved that he could get there all by himself. With Bryant, the second leading rusher, and the league's stingiest defense, the Stars were clearly headed for the top. Meanwhile, at the bottom, the Washington Federals were inventing new ways to lose football games and showing off a novel way to break a slump. Oh, wait a minute, Dan! I've had enough of this! Oh. As the losing streak ballooned to 10 games, Coach Ray Yawk's capital punishment was just a lighthearted attempt to loosen things up in Washington and convince his feds to get the let out. Finally, the feds became believers, bouncing back to win three of their last four games. It was a rousing finish and an affirmation for Coach Ray Young. Out West, Hugh Campbell's LA Express found itself in a crowded division race from start to finish. Oakland's Fred Bassana emerged as one of the league's top quarterbacks, but his explosive invaders followed an up-and-down pattern and had trouble pulling away from their Pacific Division rival. The Denver Gold stayed in the chase with an early three-game winning streak, but also couldn't sidestep the 500 fortune. And with Arizona firing away, all four teams were tied at the halfway mark. Pacific parity became the catchphrase in the wild, wild west. Throughout the season, Commissioner Simmons was present at numerous press conferences, primarily announcing the signing of new players, like Fred Dean, who left the Super Bowl champion Redskins to join the Bandits, and block for fleet-footed Gary Anderson. The Bandits also signed NFL All-Pro Chris Collinsworth, who will no doubt fit right into Bandit Ball. Well, they say that I was a strange guy coming in, and I guess I won't be a strange guy going out. <laughs> Offensive tackle Ray Penny joined the Michigan Panthers and got the chance to try out a new role. Penny made the jump from the Pittsburgh Steelers, as did Jim Smith, who signed with the Birmingham Stallions and went on to lead them in receptions. There was a huge reception for Alabama native Joe Cribbs, who also signed a sizable contract with Birmingham. You know, shall we tell the fans how much it is? 
Well, it seems Cribs preferred to talk about another enticement to play with the Stallions. I tell you, it's great to be home. Coach Riley Dodge hopes Cribs lights up his attack the way Stanford's Vincent White sparked the gold rushing game. Meanwhile, the LA Express put in a call for receivers and hooked up with UCLA's JoJo Tansell. They also extended the Pac-10 conference call to Washington's long-distance threat, Anthony Allen. Joining Anthony Allen was Michigan's Anthony Carter to present the first annual Anthony Awards. And just to demonstrate what it takes to win one, Carter scored the league's first punt return touchdown. Washington wins the You Could Drive a Truck Through That Hole Award for sending Eric Robinson on the league's only kickoff return touchdown. The award for giving the best cold shoulder goes to the Fed's Joey Walters, while New Jersey's Tom McConaughey does the best job of catching a pass while taking a bath. Our Double or Nothing Award goes to Chicago kicker Frank Corral, who turns three into six. To the Birmingham Stallions, a special citation for the imaginative use of a helmet in a supporting role. And finally, Tampa Bay's Greg Boone nets the Easy Way to the End Zone Award. As you can see, offensive players get all the glory. But when defenders get their chance for revenge, they really get you. You really got me going. You got me so I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, you really got me going. You got me so I can't be bad night. inevitability of pro football struck Denver's Red Miller. The Gold's head coach was fired. So after two-thirds of the season, the USFL had its first emotional goodbye scene between players and coach. There was just no denying Miller's popularity in the Mile High City. And into the breach stepped interim coach Charlie Army. But a week later, the gold chased away the blues by hiring another local favorite to guide the team's fortunes. To get this thing in a positive note. Greetings. Hi. Salutations. How do you feel? I feel wonderful. Craig Morton's debut surpassed even the wildest expectations. was alive at the party. But no matter who was coaching the gold, it seemed they were always full of surprises. And after all, it's the surprises that make football so much fun. I feel in motion, yeah. I'm gonna have to penalize you. Thank you. 
the biggest surprise of the season came to Boston quarterback Johnny Wolf. Well, Walton did get the last lap in one of the year's most memorable finishes. Call it the immaculate deflection, or just call it a miracle. But this game-ending pass play gave Boston that once-in-a-lifetime feeling. cardiac kid won that battle, the Philadelphia Stars of Jim Mora won the war, carrying off the Atlantic Division crown. The Stars then danced their way to Denver with a truly remarkable overtime win that ended a premature celebration by Chicago in the league's first playoff game. The Stars then awaited the last dance as the Pacific Division champion Oakland Invaders of John Ralston tried to cast their spell on the Michigan Panthers of Jim Stanley. But the Panthers were not to be denied. So it was Philadelphia and Michigan in the first ever USFL championship game. High hopes were the order of the day as the two teams squared off at Denver's Mile High Stadium. The Panthers and Stars were at the top of the game, and Bobby Hebert showed off the form that made him the league's leading quarterback. Derek Holloway gave Michigan a lead, then struck again, and the game's smallest player put Philly behind by 14. But then the Stars began to turn it around in the second half and revved up another comeback. Kelvin Bryant flashed his MVP form, but the Stars stood up to their stiffest challenge by relying on Chuck Fusina's arm. And in the fourth quarter, Willie Collier cut the lead to three. As the game was a sizzler, but Michigan could cool the coals quickly with one more touchdown. Let's go! Gotta get it in, baby! Gotta get it in! With everything on the line, the league's top quarterback thinks fast. And one of the league's best defenses calls for a blitz. But Bear sees him coming and takes the necessary steps to find number one, Anthony Carter, who does some fancy footwork of his own and scampers untouched into the end zone, giving the Panthers a 24-22 victory and undisputed bragging rights as the summer's baddest team. We burn! We burn! Well, John Corker's exuberance may be hard to top, but after one season, the entire USFL has something to celebrate.